so even energetically, right, as the intuitive, it does take a lot more for me to give than the kids because the kids is an even give and take and we fill each other's cup. With the adult, it's more like I have to come with an overflow cup because they're going to take... After leaving the corporate 9-to-5 grind, I became the boss of my own spiritual business, helping others explore and navigate the human experience from insight, wisdom, and lessons learned along the way. Today, I help aspiring spiritual entrepreneurs gain the confidence to share their gifts with the world. Welcome to the Happy Healing Shop Podcast. I'm your host, Trang Pham Nguyen, and each week we'll dive into incredible stories of strength, resilience, and transformation. So if you are ready for some serious breakthroughs, laughs and tears, and stories that will inspire you, you are in the right place, my friend. Let's get started. Our guest today is a mindfulness teacher and podcaster with over 15 years of experience in practicing mindfulness and yoga. She created Presently a Key, a mindfulness podcast featuring a community of healers who share their personal stories to inspire others to embark on a journey of self-discovery and self-love. She also founded Our Mindful Kids, an online mindfulness and meditation school for children's age 7 to 12. The program helps children become aware of their thoughts, feelings, and body sensations, which helps reduce anxiety, boost confidence, improve sleep, and increase mental focus. Her passion for mindfulness reflects her commitment to living a life of love and acceptance. Please welcome Claudia Torres. Welcome, welcome, Claudia. Hi, Trang. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Could you um, start off with, you know, I know that you have Presently a Key, which is your mindfulness podcast, but also your, you founded Our Mindful Kids. So I know most likely maybe one day you didn't just wake up and do it. So I don't know if you had a whole entire spiritual journey you went through. Um, how did you pretty much get here and do what you do today? Wow. Yes, I will do my best to uh, keep it short. <laughs> um, so I've been in the mindfulness space uh, in my mid-20s when I first put my foot on a yoga mat and met myself for the first time. And I didn't even know that was a thing. And that changed my life. And also just having the awareness of where I lived, which is I'm from New York City, born and raised, and the hyper awareness, the hyper vigilance, you know, being in a place like that. I also worked in high end luxury hotels. Um, so I had to manage expectations and be three steps ahead of the guests. So all of these tools, you know, because that also involves human behavior, observing human behavior. So I was already in this space. And so because of all those things. And so when the pandemic hit, um, I lost my job, like most people did. And by the fall, I felt compelled to want to do something. And it started with me wanting to be a host of a webinar, because I saw so many of the people I was in the circle with, they were having webinars, because now they had shift their live events into online. And I thought, well, I'm good with people, I'd be good to be a host to some of these things. And I was asked to host uh, for a Latin organization um, they had monthly um, conversations on either be finance, um, well-being. So it was just, it was interesting. I had voiced it, it came. And so shortly after, um, it dawned on me that not everyone is fit to be home with themselves and they're kind of being forced to reflect on their lives and seeing that certain things are not working really and not having a space to understand themselves and so I started a YouTube channel and I asked strangers I I reached out to people from Instagram clubhouse to be on on this in idea this new um, project that I just decided to put together and so it would be like two to three people and we would have a table conversation about a topic and that was weird right because I never thought I'd be doing it or want to do this and uh, it just felt because I was home and I felt great to be home and I know that there were a lot of people struggling so all the conversations were based around mental health and that went on from October 2020 
till Ju June, July of 22, right? Because we're in 23 already, geez. And so um, from there, uh, an amazing friend who's an angel investor gifted me a podcasting class. And so I converted this idea into a podcasting format. And then from there, it just became one-on-one. -on -one. And on, on, once I transferred this idea into a different platform, I had invited this amazing woman who teaches spirit camp to children up in Maine. And I had, we clicked so well and we connected and we had conversations outside of the podcast. And I had voiced to her that I used to teach kids yoga. I was also an environmental tour guide to children. And I, you know, and where I am, the space of mindfulness. And so a month later, she had invited me to teach at her school um, online. And I was over the hill because I never thought that I could put this into practice and teach it to the future, right? And so I immediately said yes with just so much shock. And I did that for a few months. And after a while, I decided to open up my own online school, which is ourmindfulkids.com. And it just changed my life forever. And I never anticipated, I never planned for it. It just showed up at my doorstep and I couldn't refuse this mission that was bigger than me. Something I could never have put together or, or envisioned a gold or manifested. And so I am forever indebted to the universe source, however you may call it, just to, to, be, to be the one to perform such a task that is honorable and humbling every time. And the children are just my teachers. I'm not their teacher. I always say that they don't, they're my teachers. They teach me um, ways that they want to be understood. They want to be valued, seen, and heard. And so um, because I'm naturally an intuitive person, so I teach in that mode. I teach in feeling. I feel you first, the student, and see where you are because I also have the understanding that every day we're not the same. So the child is the same way. The child may not be up to, in the mood to want to have a class or, and things like that. So I always mold. I have a curriculum, but I mold into their way of feeling that day. And then if it does apply to my class, great. If it doesn't, it's still a learning lesson of you know, managing thoughts and emotions and understanding themselves. So it, it's, it's just such a beautiful, um, I want to say like synergy between them and me. And so, and then now I've realized that I would love to have the parents be part of the class. Some parents are, some are not. And so I've started um, creating an adult class called Coming Home to Yourself because it also would be the first time that most people are coming home to themselves. For the children, they're already in that space. I don't need to introduce them to themselves. They already are in that space. It's just that the world lets, you know, forces them to forget who they already are and who they know. And so it's just me reinforcing that not to listen to that <laughs> and hold on to your authentic, genuine self, because that will take you further than any school, college, or um, I don't know anything that you may want to study because knowing yourself is the foundation to anything you want to do in this life. So that's how I landed to this space. Wow. That, I have so many questions right now, but um, I guess first I'll say uh, uh, with kids, it's not like you are, were used to working with them, but did you ever know all this time that you wanted to keep working with kids versus adults? And did you, again, you, it's like you intuitively know how to match up with their energy or what their needs are. So do you feel in a way for you specifically that you prefer to work with kids versus adults? Not that adults are worse than kids. It's just, it's, it's different. It is different, right? It's no judgment, no shame. It's just very different because at the same time, when I'm teaching the kids, I can truly be myself because they're being their most authentic selves. So it's more of like nourishing for me personally than with an adult, because with an adult, I have to deprogram you to program yourself because I'm not doing that for you. You're doing it for you. And so it's a whole different complicated space. And so even energetically, right, as the intuitive, it does take a lot more for me to give 
than the kids because the kids is an even give and take and we fill each other's cup with the adult it's more like I have to come with an overflow cup because they're going to take in the beginning until they understand how to fill their own cup. And then we can have the synergy. So it does take time versus the kid is already there. Wow. Really, really good point. It's kind of like with kids, you're starting off with more, I don't want to say a blank slate, but just an easier canvas to work with. Whereas with adults, you have to deprogram all these things we've learned or we're taught growing up. And that's not something that happens overnight. So um, with parents that might want, okay, I have two questions. One, do you notice a a, a trend or a pattern with parents that are um, open to letting their kids join your program, right? Because it's not every parent that's like, that's the thing. It's going to be maybe like sports or music lessons, things like that, right? Right. And the second thing is, do you find... um, any difficulties with parents in wanting to join with their kids in terms of, you know, you maybe get a helicopter parent or a, a parent that asks you so many questions because they're very on top of their kid. Right. A lot of the parents that automatically enroll their children already are in this space or understand what mindfulness is, or they do meditation. Like they have a certain level of self-awareness enough to know, to, to understand that the child is going to, a benefit from what I'm teaching. So that's most parents that do just by click, they don't even ask me questions. They're just like, yeah, I, I can see, you know. Um, and then there's parents that are not there. And that's where I think even if I would, I would welcome a helicopter parent. <laughs> I think I would prefer someone who wants to be involved versus someone who doesn't. It's, it's discouraging because for me, not for the child, they don't know, but because I'm paying attention, I'm so observant, you know, the parent that isn't involved, it, it, it kind of disconnects what I'm trying to teach the child and to apply it at the house, Right. Because the child would have to do it on its own. And that's already difficult, as you, you know, you and I know growing up, it can't be easy to just hold on to your authentic, genuine self and not have your parents understand you. So it, it does. Um, that's I would say that's the aspect of a parent that the parent that isn't involved. Otherwise, every parent who is involved, I welcome and I don't the behavior is okay because I understand where they're coming from, right? They want to care. They want to make sure that they're understanding and also learning something substantial, right? They're not just throwing money away. And so that I'm all about like, yeah, let's have the conversation. Let's talk about these things. So what I liked about you telling your story was just, it sounded like it wasn't even a vision you had where you're like, I'm going to do this, create my own program. It really was, I love this quote once where it said, you don't, discover or find your passion overnight, you develop it. So it's like all these little stepping stones, all these experiences you've had, and also timing and people that happen to come in your life to be like, Hey, have you thought about this to lead you to do what you're doing now, you know, and helping children. So what advice would you say to, I guess, people that are like, I don't know, uh, I feel really lost in life. I don't know what to do. Or like, I have something, but I don't know if it's going to work. Right. That's a beautiful question. Uh, I will say the one thing that I truly am appreciative of learning my passion later in life per se, because you know it's a stigma, right? You should know your passion early in life. No, <laughs> it just comes when the time is right. Because I think of where I am now pr- prior to the pandemic, right? Those two opposites, and we have those polar opposites for most of us. And the world wasn't ready to receive what I was willing to give. And I didn't even know that I was going to give it. So that's the magic there. So when you surrender and just let the universe flow through you, it'll just call you ring, ring. It's time to put X, Y, Z together and bring it on to this space. And that's kind of how it felt. So when people are in that space of feeling lost, I think that feeling lost is the grandest opportunity to find yourself, right? That's what, when people say lost, it sounds so negative. I'm like, no, it's incredible to be lost. Now let's go find you. Let's go find you. And the only way to find yourself is inward. There's, you can't find yourself out externally. I'll tell you that now. So you don't waste your time looking for yourself in all the wrong places. The only place you're going to find yourself is within. And so that's kind of how 
I would navigate the space for most people that are feeling because it's more society pressure because if you start to unravel your life and just enjoy the journey and then you can take the tools and the gems and knowledge that you've you're acquiring or will acquire and then when the time comes I think the only way to find your mission is to find yourself right because I also didn't know what I was just in this space flawlessly from being in that yoga mat the first time and it just felt like boom this is where I am the yoga the meditation the mindfulness this is where I feel home in myself right so if for anyone could be you know some creative endeavor or a financial endeavor right it it could be anything like where is it that you feel more at home with yourself when you're doing something is that is but also finding yourself to know how to provide that aspect in a bigger way than anyone else can Yeah. And you know, when you're talking about the pandemic, even though it was a very painful time for a lot of people, you know, I do believe in a way that it needed to happen because this world was kept going, including myself, where it was just, you know, when the whole world had to stop, of course, some people return back to their own ways, you know, that's human nature, right? But there's a lot of us that had to pause and be like, wait, wait a minute, what do I really want in life? I have to, I can't do anything right now except for stay at home. And, um, and really go inward, mm-hmm. you know, and heal or, or find that certain things aren't working for me or this relationship or this job is just, or, you know, I also got laid off during pandemic as well. And being like, oh, wow. I always knew I was a number, but this really sealed the deal mm-hmm. of being like, this is not, I don't want to support or go work for certain people that only see me as a number and not even a human anymore. Exactly. It's yeah. Nice. That's an important factor because that's what happened to a lot of us. We just realized like, oh, wait, this is, this life is not what I thought I wanted that I've been living this way. And I didn't never notice, right? Because mindfulness is paying attention and we never, we weren't paying attention to our habitual daily routine. And when we stopped and we had to be home, it's when a lot of people were being forced to reflect on their lives and just kind of like, oh. And there was a lot of divorces, like you're saying, a lot of, you know, career changes, moving. Um, Yeah, it's a lot of different shifts. And for the people that were um, seeing it, right? Because like you said, there's also the polar opposite where people just actually, they go back as if nothing occurred. And that's okay too. But for the ones that were ready to see, saw. Yeah. um, And also like when you were starting to work with, uh, let's see, children during this time, especially online, you know, I'm going to guess, but let me know if I'm wrong. But for a lot of the things and techniques you teach to children, they probably can be applied for adults, right? So what have you seen so far that has worked for kids um, really well? And whether it's a certain technique, um, or let's say if a parent is listening in, what they can, kind of simple ways they can do with uh, the children that you might uh, be able to give tips for them. Yeah, definitely. It's very simple. It's crazy, but you're going to be like, that's it. Mm -hmm. But the problem in the simplicity is that no one's asking these questions. And so the first question is, how are you? How was your week? How are you feeling? Tell me more about that. How did that make you feel? Are you confused about it? Do you have any questions? They want to be asked and they also want the freedom to choose so if you're not feeling up to that day I will ask you would you be open to drawing instead and we'll just draw for a half an hour right it's just having the understanding of where they need to be met it's that simple and it's big and the way they respond to me just shows me that that's not what's going on in their world at school at home, no offense, but it's because parents are busy, right? They're all working also. And and also I'm sure parents, you know, not that people are are being value seen and heard as adults. So it's not personal, not judging. It's just um, the patterning, right? The patterning, if we as adults are not being asked, hey, how are you? You know, are you okay? How can I be, how can I be of support? How can I hold space for you? Right? That's different. We don't do that for each other. So when a kid hears that, or even like when they ask me what this class is about, and I tell them this class is all about you. And they're just like, what? I'm like, yeah, we're going to learn about who you are. 
and how you know how these things that you the big emotions and the thoughts and why you feel the way you do and how to manage these aspects of yourself so it, it's really simple it's just asking and, and being in tune with your child is a big deal like being that's where the intuition kicks in I'm intuitive I'm feeling where they're feeling I just want you to tell me because I know you want to express it so that's how I that's how I maneuver my classes. Yeah. I think that, you know, sometimes parents, it is hard to be a parent, right? Yes, like you, have, you are trying to take care of this, um, the, these lives that depend on you and not every day you can have patience because sometimes, man, you have so many other things to worry about, but I think what you said, or, you know, let's say a kid starts crying over something that is probably trivial to us, but it means like a huge thing in their world. And it's really tempting to probably be like, can you just stop crying right now? That's nothing. Right. And that's probably something we also learned growing up being, you know, um, just growing up with our own parents. And so in a way, I think a lot of people think possibly that, oh, I need just problem solve or, you know, or just, but again, it's like you said, just holding space for them, meeting them there, empathizing with them, um, and just allowing them to feel those feelings, yeah. right? Because they come and go. Right. But the fact that you say, hey, kid, it's all right, they feel this way. I see that you're upset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's totally normal, you know, or let's let's see a way what we can do with these feelings or like, oh, or just even sitting there. It sounds like what you're saying is like just sitting there with them being like, I can see why you feel that way. And you, it's very valid to feel that way because it happened to you, right? So um, in, in a way, it's breaking that generational cycle mm -hmm. of where, you know, because I remember as a, when I was younger, I was like, oh, I guess I'll just discipline kids the same way my parents discipline, right, right. which is Asian way, which is not probably the most empathetic way, you know, and um, whether that might be spanking or, uh, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I guess with each generation, we are starting to break and realizing, oh, this is actually in the long run <laughs> is good, you know, spanking or whatever. And I don't, this is not to debate to, to have a, you right. know, type of discipline. I understand parents, parenting is hard, but more so of really now we're starting to learn mm -hmm. that there are other ways in the long run. Okay. Spanking or whatever, or telling your kid to shut up might be really efficient yeah. to get them to be quiet, but in the long run, is it effective? And also in being able to be in a relationship without feeling like they have to shut down or people please. Right. Yes. Big, big deal. Yeah. So it's incredible what you're doing, just starting off with children, because this will change their lives in the future and um, find ways to cope, right? Find ways to be like, okay, I'm okay in this human body. Do you find that when you have kids with parents that don't exactly integrate it at home or don't practice it with them at home and say like, okay, how are you and stuff like that? Do you see that there's a stagnant growth or like um, it can be frustrating versus um, like what progress have you seen with kids when as they go through your program um when the parent is involved obviously there's lots of growth um and then when the parent is involved it's difficult to see the growth because what happens is they won't take a second class so I won't know that's that's where that I won't be able to see like how does this affect if we go into another eight weeks because I had a student that I've had for six months but her father was all about it and participating and validating her and and it was beautiful to see this beautiful relationship with a daughter and a father um and trusting me that after a while he didn't have to be there and just um i sharing what what the practice is for the week and he'll do it at home and that's beautiful to see but the other aspect is that it's an eight week long program and if the parent isn't involved and in doesn't understand the benefits and the importance of mindfulness and meditation, they're not going to buy another class. And so I won't know. So I'll do the eight weeks and hope for the best. And hopefully that my seeds are able to bloom, right? And no one breaks down the soil of their garden and like, my seeds are gone, you know, so I can only hope I can't control or over step my boundaries. I'm not their mother. I'm just their guide into themselves. And so it's just knowing when to be able to let go and know that you, I did what I was supposed to, right. And just allow for the rest to unfold on its own. 
because then I'm going to put myself in a space where I'm going to be upset and take it personal and be triggered by it and lose the, the, the beautifulness that, that is this space that I'm in. So I really try not to sit with it. And don't get me wrong. I do get bothered when the parent isn't involved and I'm hoping for the best that when the last class is the last class that, you know, that they take my gems and they remember and that's all I can do is just hope for the best. I can't really stay stuck on like, oh, I can't believe so and so, you know. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that really honest um, uh, experience because I think sometimes people might see us entrepreneurs being like, okay, we're releasing a program, done, you know. But we also go through these emotional waves or like frustrations of like, I'm putting myself out there, I'm putting all this energy and time to help someone, and yet they can't meet halfway. And the frustrating part sometimes is being like, okay, that is their journey. This is where I have to stop or put boundaries on. And it has nothing to do with my worth. It has nothing to do with, is my program good enough? Or I need a, I need to change it. Right. Um, so growing up, uh, in New York, did you feel, were you always into spirituality and mindfulness before you started, you know, the, uh, that experience on the yoga mat or, um, or kind of like any, trials or tribulations you might have um, encountered in the space, if applicable as a Latina? Yeah, definitely. Um, growing up in New York in a Hispanic home is very similar to, I know we've had this conversation, very similar to Asian household. Um, definitely spanking belts, flip-flops. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's the discipline at the house. Uh, emotional abuse, verbal abuse. <laughs> And so, you know, I'll, I'll come back to that space, but it just made sense why I wanted to teach more so because I didn't have, I was not spiritual as a teenager because um, as a kid, as a kid, you know, there's not really choosing on like what's, what's what, um, but more like I remember as a teenager, I wasn't so spiritual, but I also would go to church with my uh, grandparents and after a year of living with them, I was just like 15 and I couldn't like wrap my head around this situation. I was raised Catholic and I couldn't, Same. I couldn't like believe it anymore. If that's the thing, like at 15, I, um, cause it was, um, a holiday. I think it was, um, uh, either Easter or Palm Sunday. It was one of those two. I remember it was like spring. And I'll never forget the thought I had at 15. And I said, we're doing this again and again this year. And then I asked, I'm like, is this an every year thing? And my family was like, yeah, every year we do this. I'm like, what? <laughs> it, I just couldn't understand or grasp that as a kid. I'm like, this makes no sense. <laughs> you know, like every year we're going to mourn Jesus. Why though? Shouldn't we be celebrating him? I'm so confused, you know? And so... After that, I, I, after I left my grandparents' home and, you know, was able to move back in with my parents, um, I just didn't go to church because my parents weren't church-going people anyway. So I just left that where it was. And, but as a teenager, I did notice that I was different, in, even in that space, right? A lot of kids aren't thinking that they're just being led by their family members and you just do, as you say, and you go along. Um, but I was always highly sensitive person and I didn't know that I was empathetic and intuitive. And so I was also like, oh, you're too sensitive. Oh, you're too that. You're too like, and, and for me, I'm like, but I don't, as a kid, you're as a teenager, you're like, I'm just being me. I don't know what you're saying to me. Why am I being judged? Right. I'm just a child. I, I'm not, I don't even know who I am. I'm too sensitive. I, and then you pick that up, right? Oh, I am too sensitive. That's a story. And you start picking up stories that your family and, and I think it's mostly family that really the stories are in your head is from childhood and the trauma um, that you weren't enough, you aren't worthy, that all these things. So it, it was a process to accept who I am, right? To finally come home to myself and understand that, that the way that our family our heritage the the patterning right was flawed right because it's not providing unconditional love it's not providing kindness compassion 
we're not being valued, seen, heard, and validated, right? It's not giving us the space to be nourished and grow into this amazing flower, into an amazing tree, you know, to be fortified and have the, you know, some people are lucky enough to have that. And I can tell who is that in that space. And I don't have to know you. I can tell when someone has been nourished and has a healthy home balance, I can tell um, it's it's all in the way they move in their energy and they live in abundance mindset and naturally and a young age and not as an adult, you learn that and you, you know, come into the space. But as a child, uh, I was always feeling as if I wasn't enough. I was always trying to be the people pleaser, always trying to be good i'm going to behave because then maybe i'll i will receive that love from my parent that i was craving for so i'll keep doing good and be good because maybe that'll do it because if i see if my brothers misbehave i don't like that treatment so maybe if i keep staying good right and that that isn't a good thing right even as i got older i realized like wow having a rebellious stage is helpful and i didn't have that so now i've learned that i've suppressed so much anger because I needed to be good and, you know, just seeing it and, and releasing the story and allowing myself to feel in full expression, even if that is anger. So it is a whole, like a, a journey, right. To finally unravel and deprogram and release and heal those traumas and notice that, you know, we are all deserving of unconditional love and to be valued, seen, heard, and validated by our friends, by our family members, by our companions, our children, and in all these aspects, but it has to start with ourselves. So even when I've had past relationships and I've picked emotionally unavailable people, but why? And, you know, some people are more are like oh it's them right and we it starts that way like oh it's like it's that type of man for me as a heterosexual it's that type of man um but then as i'm in this space and growing and learning about who i am i'm like oh it's a childhood trauma and i keep picking my parents through my relationships and it could be different forms it doesn't have to be fully how the parent is just certain ways of the trauma that you were treated as it feels normal because that was home as a kid. So you want to look for that in a partner and that makes you feel like that's normal to be emotionally abused. You know, it's like, and to be abandoned and not to be valued, seen and heard and validated, that feels normal. So when someone who is healthy and balanced and ready to give it to you, in my experience, it's really interesting how your whole nervous system's like, whoa, I don't know about that, sir. You stay over there. <laughs> But really, it's it's just because you're not used to that energy or being surrounded by that energy that it does take a moment for yourself and your system to accept and see that you are worthy and you can have these beautiful friendships and relationships and not repeat the patterning. And I love how you brought up generational trauma because I feel like generational trauma is like, you have to go see somebody to help you release these traumas, but all it is is choosing a pattern or stopping a pattern and choosing a new pattern that your family did. If that's all it is, like this pattern doesn't work, it's not gonna continue with me, this is what I'm gonna do instead. And that's how you you change, you shift that trauma. Yeah, I think the, like you, with you know, mindfulness and stuff, the first step is in a way being aware, you know, and it's really hard. Like what you said, when your body is so into this nervous state and when something happens to you, someone says like, someone might say an offhand comment and immediately you go into defensive mode or you go into a certain mode because that's what you had to do to feel like you need to survive growing up. Right. So, okay. I know people can identify with what you've gone through and become a people pleaser and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, being invalidated with as a kid, you know, as a teenager, we're such dorks at that time. We don't even know what's going on with our bodies, you know? So it's like, you know, with all those years and that challenge, those challenges that you've had, how the heck did you get through to the other side? Like, what did you find work out for you? That's a great question. I've never been asked this question before. How did I make it through? Um, I have sat with that question, <laughs> but no one's asked me. <laughs> I have sat with it though. Um, what I did notice with the pattern within myself that nat my natural inclination as a person is a giver, right? How can I 
still be that without overgiving and people pleasing and all this stuff, right? It, it's more about uh, self inquisition, getting to know yourself. And the more that I started to unravel of who I am, I started to realize that I was the only one in my group that way. And that's why I wasn't feeling accepted. And like, even like um, in my 30s, and when people, there was a moment like going out partying and it hit me and I, I thought, no, I'm, I'm too aware. Even if I had drinks, I'm drinking to not be aware because <laughs> I was already so hypervigilant. And so because you're managing your parents' expectations, right? And that's where the hypervigilance comes from. It's not even about the being in the hotel business. It's just the survivor mechanisms and just trying to understand. So I think the only way that I got through is by knowing myself and understanding what makes me so different than most people because I don't seem to fit here, 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 here. Like I've tried everything and, and meet different people and I wasn't finding my tribe or finding my space. And, um, and then when all of this unraveled, I've never felt more like myself than ever before. Even pre-pandemic, I still was working and figuring at out, like, where do I want to go? I had other career goals, but this brought me back. And I think that what helps is faith and trust because I saw it this way. I saw that, okay, if the universe is me, and I am the universe, right there, we are symbiotic, it's one and the same, then I don't think I could disappoint myself. Like, why would I do that to myself? I think that I feel that I love myself enough not to do that myself, that I'm not going to set myself up for failure or sabotage myself. And if I do, I need to notice where do I sabotage myself, right? It was more of like seeing that where okay, I, I can trust because I know that I, I won't disappoint myself. I, there's no way I do that. Like I feel this love inside that I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. So I have to trust a little more in source. I, I've been atheist too. Like I went through this, the whole circle of like gnosis of where you to find yourself. And it was until I surrendered and wanted to know right? Really dive in, in the meditation space of figuring out, asking source through meditation, tell me more about me. Tell me more about what makes me different. Tell me more of where can I use what you've given me to my brethren, right? To the community, to everyone. And it was just that and being patient, right? Because it'll come in stages. You'll get a piece of you here, a piece of you there, a piece of you there. And, and it's the same feeling. That's why I call it coming home to yourself because it is these aspects that you start to feel more like yourself. You're like, oh, that is part of me. I, I'm like, oh, the singing, like I've always been a singer, but that's always gonna be a part of me. That doesn't go away because I'm a mindfulness teacher. It, it's always going to be a part of me. So there's different aspects that you start to understand. Uh, I love to be able to express myself in my most authentic self because I feel valued, seen, and heard. When I don't and I suffocate myself, it brings me back to that trigger of that trauma when I couldn't. So it's like, where do you want, what space do I want to be in? Do I want to be suffocating myself for others? Or do I want to fully express myself and trust that the people who are meant to be in my life will show up and stay? And then just if those that leave are just not ready for someone like me and that's okay. Yeah, I was going to say, like when you said I was being surrounded by people that I was, I, I was a different one. I was a black sheep. I think a lot of people listening in and can feel that way, whether it's in their group of friends or their family. So what did that look like for you in terms of, you know, when you were going through that, where you're like, okay, I, these people are nice, but I have to, it's hard for me to let go. Or were you feeling like, peace out, I'm done. I'm <laughs> at a different level now and I'm over it. I do that now, but not before. <laughs> I am so, I'm it's such a guard on my energy and my home. 
I'm very selective as Chang knows. Like I don't allow anyone in my home. Like I don't think about like my house should be clean because someone's no one's coming unless I know <laughs> that someone is coming and I've allowed that into enter because I've realized like this energy that I'm giving and I've healed so much and so the energy is cleaner and it the light is brighter. The more work you do, you like it's like dusting off a clock, right? You can see it now and you can it's brighter and shinier and you can see the gold aspects. And um, some people are not ready for that space. Some people can't value that space within themselves. So I can't expect them to do it for me, right? So it's not personal again, but it does take time. So in my thirties, when I was feeling different, right? And seeing like mm, these friendships, right? I wasn't ready to be peace out and I'm out, I'll go find someone else. It was still, I was still suffocating myself and keeping it to myself. Even though I could see it, I was, I didn't know how to communicate it or verbalize it because I had another fear from being in my childhood was if I speak up, I will be shut up. And so I didn't know how to voice my my needs and my truth in order to have you know clear out the space and have better friends around me so it does take time for you to come into yourself in this confidence right that you you trust that what's gonna leave or what i'm gonna let go of will be replaced by something bigger and better and so that does take time and that's part of the practice too right because you're being aware of every aspect of your life and it is the aspect of yourself like okay, I see that this doesn't work. How can I shift it? How can I release it? How can, so it has to, you have to really, I guess, self-inquisitive inquisitive, inquisitive, uh, inquisitive of, of all those things before you can take action outside of yourself. So even if you see it, it has to be, you have to solidify that space within yourself first, create that foundation to feel strong enough to say, hey, I, you know, X, Y, Z, you said this to me and, you know, that hurt me. And I wanted to know where is that coming from or why are you saying this? So that takes time, at least for me, right, in the childhood that I was brought up in, it took me some time to have the confidence to say my truth and, and tell people, like, there's people that I meet that are new and they're like, oh, maybe if I come over, I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> you don't invite yourself to my house. That's not how that works in my in my life in my reality right it's just more like do i feel comfortable energetically i know intuitively already if i can trust you but there are some people that just like i was saying with the clock and being brighter what you end up becoming is a a, a flame to the moth and so moths are gonna come but that doesn't mean that they're ready to you know, um, respect that light that you are, be the, that fire, right? Um, they get too close and they get burnt and then you get burnt and like, it doesn't become a good situation. So it's just uh, knowing how to still be a light for people that are not ready and just still having the boundaries and learning how to create those boundaries with people. Um, because when a person isn't self-aware, when I'm creating a boundary from awareness, they don't know the difference of me of me uh, having this sacred space versus me, you know, it's not personal. They're gonna take it personal and like, oh, I can't believe that. Instead of understanding and respecting why I choose to live the way I do, right? Um, because I do that for everybody because I am aware that we all are different people and everything, life isn't the same. We don't digest life the same and process life the same, but it, it, it takes time is where I'm going. It's, it just takes some time for you to finally be like, no, not you. Wow. That was so good, Claudia. I just remember thinking like, wow, this is the TEDx talk for Claudia. But, uh... <laughs> maybe, maybe yes. Right. Cause I yeah. have thought about TEDx, so, but that'll be later, but it's, it's definitely up in the cloud in the, yep. in the ethers of like, I would love to do that. Yeah, because I think you were able to articulate and explain that this whole entire process of us coming back to ourselves, finding what we like, what we don't like, um, it takes time and it's a frustrating process because no one teaches this when we grow up and it really is trial and error. And that's what takes a while. And also the honesty of, and I went through this as well. And I think we will continue to go through through life of just like, okay, I think 
these people were great during this time, but there's, you know, there's that saying where people are, there's some people are just there for a season in your life. And we know that, but I think when we're going through it and being like, how do I cut this person off? Do, or do we do the slow fade away? Or is it, do you have that confrontation or talk about them being like, Hey, like, how do you tell someone like, Hey, I don't want to hang out with you anymore because I don't think you're, 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 uh, I think we're just two different people. Right. Yeah. And so thank you for just sharing the honesty of that and how we can't, it's just not one day where we go like deuces. Bye. No, I actually had a 16 year friendship with a friend and I had to let that go. Cause I saw that I was I went through a different road and this person is not going to go where I'm going. And through time, I didn't say anything because I was like, maybe, maybe it's just me, right? Because I'm still learning about me. I'm like, maybe it's just me. Maybe we will end up crossing again. And like, you know, we're still friends, right? They don't know what I'm thinking and feeling, but what I'm seeing. And so it, it, it automatically does it. Like, you would be surprised how much the universe gets so involved in your friendships. It's like, no. <laughs> but it, it does still come back to the space that you have to vocalize and say as much as it hurts listen you, you aren't you aren't showing up for me like you stop showing up for me you stop doing this and I needed you and you just say you know you just have to really say your piece and if you don't if I didn't say that then this person's going to message me or call me a year from now and think that it's still okay and that behavior isn't okay you know, we're adults, call me, let's, let's zoom, like, you know what I mean, like uh, a FaceTime, so it just, it's not easy, but also when you lose, like, uh, long-time friendships or relationships, grieve them, because they deserve, you gave so much, you both gave so much, you had great times, and had a, a shared experience, and it, it, it's good to grieve them, and give the respect that was there, and what it did for you, and there were catalysts, to your life and so um but it does take time for you to finally say this doesn't feel good and how can I express that wow you're so good Claudia <laughs> <laughs> like can you tell more about the programs and uh, that you offer and then where people can find you if they want to learn more about you perfect yes yeah, so the the kids mindfulness class is an eight-week program and it's held on Saturdays, I might change that though. I might have it more available during the week as well. And it is a 30 minute class um, because they're children. I don't need them more than, they don't need me 30, you know? And believe me, they do hold on to me. And I've, I've sat there for 45 minutes to an hour and I'm okay with that. Uh, but it's not a class, it's more like they're enjoying the space, right? Um, so it's 30 minutes for eight weeks and I've sat with it many times over and eight weeks is the perfect time because I get to go into the full spectrum of everything that they are, whether they continue with me or not, I cover everything, the emotions, the thoughts, who they are, how to process, how to integrate, how to embody these aspects within themselves. And then for the adults, I, I'm just gonna finish the beta testing tomorrow night, which I'm excited for. And then I will be releasing that early August. And that'll be, um, so I'm leaving everyone a choice as the adult. It's going to be a four-week program. Either you choose 30 minutes or an hour. Uh, obviously, the pricing would be different, but it all depends on your schedule. And I don't want to you know, push away people because of finance, especially now in, in this economy that we're in is bananas. So I want to be fair and you get a choice of what you're able to afford um, while helping me as well, because I too am going through my own uh, space of being affected by the economy as we speak. Um, I also have a podcast called Presently Aquí, and Aquí means here in, in Spanish. So it's presently here, but presently Aquí. And that's uh, A-Q-U-I. So anything that you need me is under Presently Aki. You can go to the website and then you'll see our mindfulkids.com is on there as well. Uh, the podcast, all the guests, all the healers that I've had on there. So if you ever need someone in a specific space to help guide you that isn't mindfulness, I've had them on the show and you can contact them. Everyone's open and amazing. Uh, I've had even guests cross teach each other is just beautiful. So it's all about creating a community that also we didn't grow up with. So it's just things that 
I saw lacking. I was like, all right, we need this now as adults because we're still kids inside and we still deserve to be like, if you're, you know, the, the kid that always wanted Legos and you're 45, go buy your Legos. Like there's no reason not to go buy your Legos or, or if you were a girl who never, like your family never afforded Barbies and you always want, go get yourself one. Like there's no reason, like the shaming of like, well, those are for kids. We're still those kids inside. So um, I, yeah, I do try to help the adults to understand like you have to tap into that space in order for you to come home to yourself because your inner child is waiting for you um, to see them, hold them, value them, be seen and validated like they weren't. But you can do that for yourself. So, um, yeah, that's that's where I'm at presently. Aki everywhere and all platforms. Oh, thank you so much, Claudia, for doing the work that you do. Because I feel like you know, as we continue to be a light in this world, then one by one the world can heal. Yes, one by one. That's right. Yeah, and again, like getting in touch with the inner child and how um, it's something as an adult we forget to do because we, you know we weren't encouraged to do that, right? So how beautiful it is as simple to uh, as silly as it might sound getting what you kind of the Legos or the Barbie that you kind of wish that you were able to play with when you're younger and tapping into that creative side. So again, thank you so much for being here. You were amazing. Thank you, thank you so much for hosting me. This was fun. And it's always nice to be on the other side. So I appreciate it anytime <laughs> to come on someone else's show to just relieve the pressure and just be like, Hey, yes, let's have a chat. So, but thank you for being amazing always. And from the moment we met and it's just been so wonderful. Thank you. And that does it for today's episode. Wasn't Claudia just amazing? I hope you were inspired by her journey and the messages she had to tell. And did any of her stories and insight resonate with you? If so, I'd love to hear all about it. And if you enjoyed this episode, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button right now. So you don't miss out on any episodes coming up. And remember, the magic continues over at thehappyhealingshop.com, where you'll find tons of free resources to help you and support you on your own spiritual journey. And until we meet again, my friend, always remember to shine your light brightly and to share your story, because you'll never know who it can help or inspire to create a change in their own world. Thanks so much for being here, and I'll see you soon.